beginners, ETFs versus mutual funds. ETF is exchange traded funds. That's what we're going to talk about here today. My friends, before you hang up, because you don't uh, like investments, they bore you or you think all there is you need to know, do not hang up yet. Do not go away from this video. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, there is such critical information on the two investment vehicles that you can use. And if you don't know it, it can cost you a big time. That's what we're going to talk about here today. So welcome to Heritage Wealth Planning YouTube channel, the place you come to learn about tax planning, investment planning, financial planning, retirement planning, estate planning, 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 planning. So don't forget to subscribe. Subscribe down below. And once you do subscribe, hit the bell to be notified for future content. All right, my friends, let's dive right into this. This man, this gets me fired up. So let me just start with the premise. I work with a client, a wonderful, wonderful man. And uh, he has a large non-qualified account. So remember, what we call non-qualified is a taxable, some would call it a brokerage account. I don't like the word brokerage because a CD is a taxable account as well, as long as it's not an IRA. So non-qualified or a taxable account are the same thing, all synonymous with you pay taxes on any income that's distributed throughout the year, right? IRAs, you don't. Annuities, you don't. Life insurance, you don't. A non-qualified or a taxable account, again, synonymous, you pay tax on any income distributions. All right, so I'm working with him and I'm putting together a plan and I'll share, uh, not his stuff, but I'll share with you in a, a different video what we're coming up with. And he has a pretty good amount of money in a, a non-qualified account and all in, uh, in exchange traded funds, which is good. And I'll, again, stay with me and I'll tell you why that is. But it, we, I changed around a little bit. I said, let's just throw this to a mutual fund and see what the difference is, all right? And now what happens is the taxes that he has to pay on an ongoing basis when it's in a mutual fund is significantly higher by, I mean, it's not even close, than the taxes he would have to pay in the ETF. And again, this is a non-qualified account. I cannot stress this enough. This is not your IRA. And I'll get to the reason for that. But I mean, we're talking just a phenomenal amount more money he has to pay to the IRS. And he's in the state of California. And I'm not even talking about Governor Brown either. I'm just talking about President Trump. A phenomenal more amount, which all that does is it hurt his net worth. All right. So the difference between a net worth and an ETF and a net worth and a mutual fund, I mean, we're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars. And you might be saying that doesn't make any sense. They're both they're both investment vehicles. Why should one have preference over the other? So let's dive right into this. this is, I'm telling you, my friends, critically important for you to understand this. So we're going to do a two articles. This might bore you to death, but I'm telling you, stick with me because this article we're going to start from Forbes is by a guy named William Baldwin. I've read him before. He's a good guy. Enjoy the ETF tax dodge while you can. And I. I'd take some umbrage with the idea that it's, it'll be fixed, quote unquote, anytime soon because that assumes it's broken. It's not. All right. You don't own exchange traded funds in your taxable account. You're missing out. You do. Then you're benefiting from a nifty loophole. I hate when they say that term loophole. There's not a loophole. It's just a tax code. There's a loophole in the tax code. It is what it is. You can either take advantage of the tax code or you're not. It's not a loophole like you're taking advantage of it in a nefarious manner. The loophole has not gone unnoticed among academics, and the cries for reform are heard by politicians everywhere. ETF investors are going to owe more in capital gain taxes. That's what they want. Yeah. All right, good luck with that, academics. Uh, you've really done a good job being bipartisan there. As the law stands now, ETS pay scant capital gains. I don't know why it says capital gain dividends. I, I don't get that. I shouldn't say dividends because it does pay dividends, but just scant capital gains. Even when the market is steaming up and lots of investors are going in and out of the fund. With an ETF, you get pretty much the same tax treatment you get if you bought the component stocks and never sold any. My friends, understand that with an ETF, it's like you own the individual constituents in the fund and never sold them. The only thing you have to pay is dividends. And if there's an interest of a bond, but a bond is not a stock, so there is no interest. But still, if you have a... If they did have bonds in there, you have to pay interest on any interest payments. But that's it. You're not paying capital gains tax. That makes an ETF a terrific buy for the flex for the taxable account of a buy and hold investor. Ring, 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 ring. That is the bell. Like Warren Buffett, who is it? Warren Buffett says the market never was a or Louis Rukeyser. Some guy never said the bell never rings at the top and it never tells you at the bottom. A gong's at the bottom or rings at the top. This is a ring for it being a wonderful vehicle for your taxable accounts and ETF. There is scant capital gains. 
The investor in an open-ended fund, a mutual fund, isn't so lucky. Suppose this fund owns shares of Apple and whatever, and the shares shoot up in price. If enough fund customers want out, the fund will be forced to sell appreciated stock and, and pair to, uh, appreciate shares to pay them off. That will generate a capital gain for the fund, and the gain will be distributed to all the other investors who are holding the wet bag. That's a huge negative about mutual funds. You, you hold the wet bag as a long-term investor. You're, you're paying more capital gains than someone who's get, buying and selling, getting in and out. So, horrific, actually. A capital gain distribution doesn't make anyone richer. I cannot agree with that more. If your $50 fund disperses $4 capital gain, it becomes worth $46 right then. That's exactly what happens. You've got the same $50 you had before, $4 in capital gain and $46 in, in uh, the share price. But now the IRS wants a piece of the $4. Contrast two almost identical funds, the Dreyfus S&P 500 and the BlackRock S&P 500 ETF. They both own Apple and 499 other stocks. I don't even know how to pronounce that. NVIDIA, I guess. The Dreyfus fund is organized the old-fashioned way as an open-end fund that redeems departing customers in cash. The iShares, which is an ETF, makes no cash redemptions. If you have the misfortune to own the Dreyfus, the Dreyfus product in your taxable account, you have an unwanted gain of $4 dumped into your lap each of the last two years. You could have gotten the same total return from the iShares without such distributions. How do ETFs avoid paying out capital gains? They have figured out an obscure part of the tax code into a shelter. Section 852B-6. 852B-6, we're going to quiz you on that. The code allows funds to make redemptions in kind without tax effect. The purpose of this ancient rule is to enable an open end that gets a swarm of redemption orders at one lar or one large one to disperse but not cash out, rather a slice of the portfolio to someone tendering shares. For open end funds like Dreyfus, redemptions in kind are a desperate measure to be used in the event of panic. For ETFs, though, Redemptions in kind are the normal way of conducting business. When investors want out of an ETF, market makers pick up their shares for cash and tender the shares to the fund, receiving in return baskets of stock. They then sell those baskets, earning a modest spread for the efforts. The middleman, for example, might buy 3 million ETF shares, surrender them for collection of Apple, NVIDIA, and other stocks worth 3.01 million, unload those stocks, and pocket a $10,000 gain. Coming into play here is another tax, ancient tax rule allowing stock owners partially exiting a position to specify what shares are being disposed of. All right, so we're not, that's called a, a, a specific identification. You're identifying which block of shares you sell as opposed to just an average. ETFs, knowing they won't have to recognize a gain on the transaction, do just the opposite. They redeem using their cheapest NVIDIA shares. That doesn't cause any problem for the market maker, who in our example will be purporting $10,000 of taxable income in any event. It does call, it'll cause a problem for the tax collector because it causes the ETFs unrealized gains to evaporate. None of this makes any difference to the short-term investor, blah, blah, blah. But if you're an investor of the long horizon, you'd be much better off in your ETF. Your $3 of appreciation will stay in the fund and compound. Paying tax on the $3 gain decades later is much better than having to pay tax now. Indeed, you can permanently escape income tax on the capital gains if you do one of three things in your ETF shares. Give them to a low-income relative, give them to Sherry, or leave them in your estate. So I just got to listen. Stop. Whatever you're doing, put your phone down. You can permanently escape income tax on your capital gains if you give away your shares to a low-income relative who's at a 0% capital gain. I challenge that greatly. Give them to a charity that's, yeah, or leave them in your estate. What that, you got to understand that what I'm saying here. You don't pay capital gains if you just sit on that sucker and let that go. All right? You don't pay any. A mutual fund, you do. We're talking significant difference and upside potentially are significant. Do understand the limitations of the ETF loophole, blah, blah, blah. They don't eliminate taxes. Well, they could. If you have it at death, your step up basis means you're not paying any tax on those capital gains and neither are your heirs. But I do uh, be okay. they always characterization of ETF tax avoidance by a Fordham law professor says it's a tax window. I could care less what Fordham Law Professor says. If you follow some of these Fordham professors, they're just insane, insane people. No other way around that. So tax window, anything's a tax window when, the, when you can have a loophole, all right, because anything that's a loophole is a swindle, apparently. 
uh, a commentator. He was a commentator in the American Bar Group. I mean, so this is kind of reaching the bottom of the barrel. Costly and indefensible tax expenditure. So that's the our guy, the author of this article, is saying that uh, a lot of academics are pushing against the, the repeal of the ETX, ta- ETF tax window. It's just not enough to, to, to talk about. So, all right. Remember that. So I'm going to dive into this article right here. Let's Almost the second point. All right, I'm going to do part two of this because this is a two part article here. But I want because this second article we're going to talk about here by Rob or not, it, man, this is your alpha big enough to cover his taxes. We're going to talk about that in detail here in just a second. So part two is coming up. Remember, an ETF does not pay capital gains or you don't pay capital gains. A mutual fund, you do. Every year there's capital gain distribution. Someone is paying tax on it in the mutual fund. Every year that's going to be you because mutual fund must give you the shares, all right, or the price and transfer the, to you as the end holder. You have to pay the tax on that. Even if you plan on sitting on that puppy for years and years and years, and ETF you don't, it just grows unencumbered, unencumbered, unencumbered each and every year until you die. And when you Give it to your heirs, be it your surviving spouse, be it your kids. If you live in a common law state, it's one thing. If you live in a community property state, completely different in terms of step up basis. But either way, there is a step up basis, if not the entirety of the account, to at least half of it, depending on what kind of law you, you live under. And your domicile state don't want to get in that here. But ETF, if you have a taxable account, so going back to the guy I'm working with, he has ETF, thank goodness. And when I'm running these numbers, like, man, we got to get it. So what happens is my software is just pulling it because I put it in there as assumptions of a a 5% portfolio turnover. So if you had a $100,000 investment account, we have a 5% turnover. It's saying there's going to be $5,000 of capital gain distributions each and every year. Now, rightly or wrongly, that's what it's picking up on. So I said, whoa, whoa, whoa. If we have ETFs, we don't need that 5% turnover because there is no turnover. There is no capital gain. This might be a little bit too much. So I ran the numbers in two comparative, two completely different situations. One's a low turnover index fund and one's a zero turnover ETF. And the difference is insane. It's insane. We're literally hundreds of thousands of dollars left in his estate because of the ETF, the way ETFs are taxed. You're going to have to make a good case. If you're a fiduciary and you're holding it yourself as an investment advisor to clients, you're going to have to make a wonderful, wonderful case of why they should hold a mutual fund as opposed to an ETF. I, I simply don't see it. On top of mutual funds, generally higher fees. Uh, I just, I, I, I don't see how anyone in a taxable account should hold a mutual fund as opposed to ETF. I just don't. So think about that because on the fiduciary construct of certified financial planners and the financial planning board, this you're going to have a hard time holding up your end of the thing if you ever get looked at for, wait, 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 why did you have that guy in that high active managed high cost fund that was paying big capital gains when you could have this low cost ETF that actually outperformed. You got to think about that. All right. So stay tuned for part two. I'm going to talk about this next story uh, article from Rob Arnott, who's one of my heroes in the investment world. So hang tight. We'll see you next time. Thanks guys.